Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Other Side of the Sky by Arthur C. Clarke. Dane reads. Okay, so as always, I'm going to read the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs before I share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. This is a short story collection. Arthur C. Clarke is like the man of sci-fi, except he's not because he's not Asimov, but he's the second man of, Asim <laughs> of sci-fi. He's the second man of Asimov as well. All right, blurb. The other side of the sky presents a glimpse of our future, a future where reality is no longer contained in earthly dimensions, where man has learned to exist with the knowledge that he is not alone in the universe. These stories of other planets and galactic adventures show Arthur C. Clarke at the peak of his powers, sometimes disturbing, always intriguing. So let's check out these tabs. We'll start with uh, Refugee. And um, basically this is about a prince who wants to travel into space. He says, uh, still you'll know all that from the old news recordings. The prince smiled. Yes, he said. I've often run through them at the palace. I think I've watched every incident in all the pioneering expeditions. I was sorry to see the end of the rockets too, but we could never have had a spaceport here on Salisbury Plain. The vibrations would have shaken down Stonehenge. Stonehenge? queried Saunders as he held open a hatch and led the prince through into hold number three. Ancient monument, one of the most famous stone circles in the world. It's really impressive and about 3,000 years old. See it if you can, it's only 10 miles from here. I mean, I think everyone knows Stonehenge, don't they? I guess that's how far in the future it is that people have stopped caring about history. Uh, we get this little bit of dialogue that I enjoy. I saw you on that quiz program last night, remarked Chambers. You look pretty ghastly. Thank you. That's just the sort of sympathetic encouragement I need at the moment. I'd like to see you think up a synonym for jejun after you've been up until three in the morning. Vapid, replied Chambers promptly. Insipid, said Mitchell, not to be outdone. Somebody get some advice here. The British have two religions, cricket and the royal family. Never attempt to criticise either. Well, I'm British and I hate them both. Although I don't want to abolish uh, cricket. And we get a reference to them drinking the traditional toast to Newton, Oberth and Einstein. Saunders wondered how this little ceremony had originated. Space crews had certainly been doing it for at least 60 years. Perhaps it could be traced back to the legendary rocket engineer who made the remark, I've burned more alcohol in 60 seconds than you've ever sold across this lousy bar. And then we get this which just tickled me because I can picture it, you know? Two hours later, the last course correction that the tracking stations on Earth could give them had been fed into the computer. From now on, until Mars came sweeping up ahead, they were on their own. It was a lonely thought, yet a curiously exhilarating one. Saunders savoured it in his mind. There were just the three of them here, and no one else within a million miles. In the circumstances, the detonation of an atomic bomb could hardly have been more shattering than the modest knock on the cabin door. Captain Saunders had never been so startled in his life. With a yelp that had already left him before he had a chance to suppress it, he shot out of his seat and rose a full yard before the ship's residual gravity field dragged him back. Chambers and Mitchell, on the other hand, behaved with traditional British phlegm. They swivelled in their bucket seats, stared at the door, and then waited for their captain to take action. And moving on to the other side of the sky. So I just thought this was an interesting little paragraph. Sometimes I'd focus one of our telescopes onto the distant, brilliant star of the observatory. In the crystal clarity of space I could use enormous magnifications and could see every detail of our neighbour's equipment. The solar telescopes, the pressurised spheres of the living quarters that house the staff, the slim pencils of visiting ferry rockets that had climbed up from Earth. Very often there would be space-suited figures moving among the maze of apparatus, and I would strain my eyes in a hopeless attempt at identification. It's hard enough to recognise anyone in a spacesuit when you're only a few feet apart. But that didn't stop me from trying. Uh, so we get this story, I think it's called the Wall of Darkness, where it's all about this like big wall that's sort of stops off the end of the world. Uh, there's a typo on that page as well. I think it's meant to say, one of my uncles said Brailden once reached the wall when he was a young man. But it actually says, one of my uncles said Brailden one reached the wall when he was a young man. And then we get this story about like aliens are trying to warn us as a species that the end is coming. And uh, the only way they can do it is to, to like reach somebody who's quite like weak minded. Um, and they do that by getting like they hit somebody who's drunk basically and he and uh, you know they disappear and he goes so much for that hallucination thought Bill I was getting tired of it anyway let's see what the next one's like as it happened there wasn't a next one for five seconds later he passed out cold just as he was setting the combination of the file cabinet the next two days were rather vague and bloodshot and he forgot all about the interview on the third day, something was nagging at the back of his mind. He might have remembered if Brenda hadn't turned up again and kept him busy being forgiving. And there wasn't a fourth day, of course. So on to Venture to the Moon. And this is cool because I, I guess this was written before the moon landing. Yeah, it was. First published in 1961. But the, we get these fictitious first people to land on the moon. It's just strange to read because we're so accustomed to, with, with society with uh, Aldrin and Armstrong, you know? 
And on this story as well, someone's like made these this bow and arrow that you can fire on the moon. And uh, it says, it was uncanny to watch the almost flat trajectory of the arrows. They seem to be traveling parallel with the ground. If he wasn't careful, someone warned Trevor, his arrows might become lunar satellites and would hit him in the back when they completed their orbit. And me, I'm just reading that with an author's perspective, thinking like, oh man, if only James Lightfold and Miley O'Hara were on the moon, that'd be a great little sci-fi murder mystery. I'm surprised Asimov didn't do it. Uh, and then we get, we get this bit, uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we, the fact that the Russian expedition had taken a botanist to the moon had caused a great deal of amusement, though it was really no odder than the fact that there were biologists on both the British and American ships. I'm just there like, hey man, Mark Watney, he was a botanist. Sometimes you need a space botanist. And uh, this I just thought was a fascinating little paragraph. It's one of the most fundamental rules of lunar explanation that no one goes anywhere alone on the surface of the moon. So many accidents can happen, which would be trivial if you were with a companion. How would you manage, for example, if your spacesuit developed a slow leak in the small of the back and you couldn't put on a repair patch? That may sound funny, but it's happened. And uh, we get somebody who gets killed by the botanist, I believe. He gets killed by his own cactus that he's bred that lives on the moon, but it fires like spores really far, basically. And one of those spores hits him in the head like a bullet. I quite like this line here, rather well, this paragraph. All the optical equipment of the three expeditions seemed to have been gathered together to record the performance. Telescopes, spectroscopes, motion picture cameras and everything else one could think of were lined up ready for action. And this I knew was nothing compared with the battery that must be zeroed on us from Earth. Every amateur astronomer who could see the moon tonight would be standing by in his back garden listening to the radio commentary that told him of the progress of the experiment. I glanced up at the gleaming planet that dominated the sky above me. The land areas seemed to be fairly free from cloud so the folks at home should have a good view. That seemed only fair, after all, they were footing the bill. And uh, I'm just gonna read what happens here at this point. So they're setting off these bombs, basically, to create this, like, explosion from the moon that everyone can watch from Earth. The seconds and minutes ebbed away, then a sudden yellow glow began to spread across the sky like a vast and unwavering aurora that became brighter even as we watched. It was as if an artist was sprawling strokes across the stars with a flame-filled brush. And as I stared at those strokes, I suddenly realised that someone had brought off the greatest advertising coup in history. For the strokes formed letters, and the letters formed two words. The name of a certain soft drink too well known to need any further publicity from me. How had it been done? The first answer was obvious. Someone had placed a suitably cut stencil in the nozzle of the sodium bomb, so that the steam of escaping water had shaped itself to the words. Since there was nothing to distort it, the pattern had kept its shape during its invisible ascent to the stars. I'd seen skywriting on Earth, but this was something on a far larger scale. Whatever I thought of them, I couldn't help admiring the ingenuity of the men who had perpetrated the scheme. The O's and A's had given them a bit of trouble, but the C's and L's were perfect. I wonder what they might have been for. And then towards the end of that we get, as for the experiment itself, it was completely successful from the scientific point of view. All the recording instruments worked perfectly as they analysed the light from the unexpectedly shaped cloud. But we never let the Americans live it down, and I am afraid poor Captain Vandenberg was the one who suffered most. Before he came to the moon he was a confirmed teetotaler, and much of his refreshment came from a certain wasp-wasted bottle. But now, as a matter of principle, he can only drink beer, and he hates the stuff. Basically, the mission comes to an end, but a few of them decide to stay behind, and here's why. Seven months! That, as Williams had pointed out, was the all-important figure. We had been on the moon for more than half a financial year, and for all of us, it had been the most profitable year of our lives. Sooner or later, I suppose, this interplanetary loophole will be plugged. The Department of Inland Revenue is still fighting a gallant rearguard action, but we seem neatly covered under Section 57, Paragraph 8 of the Capital Gains Act of 1972. We wrote our books and articles on the moon, and until there's a lunar government to impose income tax, we're hanging on to every penny. And if the ruling finally goes against us, well, there's always Mars. And just this one last little thing uh, from this alien's point of view says, there was seldom any trouble. Really intelligent races can always cooperate once they've got over the initial shock of learning that they are not alone in the universe. So yeah, all in all, The Other Side of the Sky by Arthur C. Clarke. I did enjoy reading it. I would give it a pretty solid four out of five. Um, it reminded me of things like iRobot by Isaac Asimov. I just really enjoy short stories, especially in sci-fi. Uh, I guess because the, what I like about sci-fi is when it's speculative and it kind of asks you questions, you know? Uh, especially like philosophical questions. So Asimov does it really well with the laws of robotics. Um, Arthur C. Clarke kind of goes off in a different direction, but um, still very much enjoyable, so would recommend. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Other Side of the Sky by Arthur C. Clarke. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.